we are going to talk today about optics, and uh, uh, this is just an uh, uh, introduction to lenses. Uh, most of the optical devices which we use in everyday life depend on the lenses, and lens making is a, is a kind of art which has been uh, developed by uh, our civilization. I show you the picture of the Nimrod lens, which goes back to the prehistoric time, so to say. And we now, uh, of course, have a fantastic lenses, like these plastic lenses in our glasses, or the m very small lenses, which are in our photo cameras, in our apparatus, and we also have a huge, huge lenses in the telescope, like the, um, that on, Mount in, on the Tenerife Island, or the uh, lenses on the telescope, which are stationary on the satellites. And making uh, lenses is a really a complicated business, and um, uh, the lens makers were always considered to be a, uh, the artists between craftsmen, so to say, and uh, it became eventually a, a, a te technology, a part of a f technology and uh, a, a considerable business. But there were a few companies which have been very famous for making a extremely high quality lenses in Europe. The company which that uh, which was one of the leading one was a Zeiss, which is a German company in Vienna, in uh, which uh, had a complicated history after the Second War, when it was split into the two companies. One which was uh, is still in Vienna and was the main Zeiss, and the other which was a small part of it in West Germany, and eventually they were united. But when this, the, the, the German Republic, the German Democratic Republic, so to say, DDR was still existing, a size in Vienna may, attempted to make the big giant lens, actually it was rather a mirror, for a, a huge telescope which the Soviet Union was building in somewhere on the top of the, one of the mountains on the Cauc in, in Caucasus. And uh, uh, this is a tremendous undertaking because you, if you make a huge piece of glass, uh, then uh, uh, it has a considerable weight. And therefore, when it's suspended, it's under a tremendous forces. And this is an elastic medium, after all, I mean, the glass. So it can very easily get deformed by application of the forces, and that actually was happening when this giant mirror was shipped from Vienna to somewhere. They had to build a special railroad cart to carry that mirror, and the mirror was a failure. And the, the telescope actually never worked the way it was supposed to work. But there was another company of equal quality, so to say, Perkins in the United States, which was commissioned to make a, a mirror for a Hubble telescope. And they made the mirror, and the, mirror, the telescope was lifted up by, a, by the missile and put up in orbit, and it turns out that it is uh, defective. Fortunately, Perkins invented a f trick how to improve it by, by uh, uh, ele essentially electronic gadgets, but uh, uh, this blame with the, with the mirror at Hebel was sufficient to kill a historic, historical company. It exists under the different name nowadays. So the original Perkins company was gone. So making lenses is a complicated business. And also making as, uh, optical devices built by lenses is, is a kind of a complicated uh, story. So uh, uh, it's not actually mm, very difficult to 
came to the conclusion that it would be nice to build uh, optical devices without lenses to construct and uh, that at uh, the first glance might look like a very strange idea but uh, that is actually what had happened and we are now on a stage where there are companies which try to manufacture and commercialize uh, optical devices which are lens-free, lens-free optics is something. So what I would like to uh, do over uh, probably these two today and next week is to tell you first about uh, uh, mathematics of lenses. How do we really describe lenses following the, our mathematics which is available to us nowadays and uh, then we will chat a little bit about this uh, very lens uh, this lens free uh, optics uh, and uh, uh, which is interesting uh, in itself um, the mathematics of lenses is complicated and therefore most of my uh, talk will be restricted to a, a very unphysical models of lenses which are called the thin lenses and you will see in a moment what I meant by that but uh, it will give you a flavor of uh, what we are talking about and a particular uh, chapter of my talk which will be devoted to the matrix description of the lenses is, uh, is actually, uh, although I will phrase it in the language available for, for the thin uh, lenses, it's generally true, so you will have a flavor of uh, how the real computation of optical devices na is uh, run nowadays. So we are going to talk about the lenses and the first, uh, 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 first um, uh, problem we are going to attack is, uh, is uh, uh, one is the interface between the two uh, uh, um, media with different diffraction indices. The, uh, the, on the left side of the, the, and that interface, which is a thin black line uh, on, the, on, on this, there should be now, is there an arrow on the picture on the screen? Because this is complicated. The computer tells me that there should be a, 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 an arrow moving there, and it moves on my screen, and it doesn't move on your screen. This is curious. Anyway, so this is this thin curve, which uh, maybe this this does not have a pointer. Uh, we have this thin black line which shows the curved interface, and the uh, the refraction index on the left is n with sub i uh, one, and on the other is the other n, and this is a, a, a curved interface. And the, uh, the geometry is as follows. We, on the left, it's, it's a convention. On the left, there is an object. The symmetry line on the picture is an optic line. It's optic axis of my device. So this interface is, uh, irrespectively of whether this is correct on the picture or not, is meant to be symmetric with respect to that line. And on the left side of that, uh, it's always left side. When it's left for me, it's also left for you. Uh, on the left side, there is an object which is denoted by O. And uh, this is a source of the electromagnetic wave. And the ray of the electromagnetic wave, which is, pointed here, is painted here blue, uh, it's my choice, this is a line along which the k vector of that particular electromagnetic wave is directed. So you can look at this picture that there is this Frenet Segre triad on, which is not shown. There is a k vector pointing along the blue line and there are electric and a magnetic fields which are perpendicular to this plane. Uh, one of them is in the plane and one is out of the plane. 
And the ray, uh, which is quotation mark emitted from the point of O, is under the angle gamma. And it hits the, the interface, and there it is refracted. Because it is a curved interface, I make an assumption that this is a part of a sphere, which on my two-dimensional picture, it's a, it's a circle. Therefore, the normal coordinate, the normal direction to the interface is along the radius of that, uh, in that part of this circle or a sphere, and I will uh, denote it the radius of the sphere by the capital R, and the point C on the drawing, it's a center of, the, of, that, uh, of that curved interface. Okay, uh, the, the angle at which the beam, the blue beam hits the, that interface is called alpha, and it is refracted under the angle beta, which is also shown on the picture. And that refracted beam propagates now in a medium with refraction index n sub 2, and eventually it crosses the optical axis. And the point where it crosses the optical axis, I will denote by capital I, and that I will call an image. So we have these two points, the object and the image points. And the angle which the refracted beam uh, forms with the optical axis of the device is called gamma prime. I believe the prime is gone for some reason on that picture. I was trying to make a movie and turns out that the movie doesn't run and it somehow had eaten up the primes. So I apologize for it. So now this will be a course of trigonometry, <laughs> I am, I'm afraid, but rather very simple. Because uh, this is uh, Consider a triangle O, the point where the beam hits the interface and, the, uh, and the, the center of the curvature, C. Therefore, we have a triangle with two angles, the gamma and the phi, and alpha is the sum of those two angles because it's this external angle of the triangle. So we have a first identity that the angle alpha is related to the angles gamma and phi. The other uh, 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 simple relation is that we can look at the other triangle, which is a triangle, the image, a center of an interface, and the point on the interface. That triangle has the gammas beta and gamma prime, and therefore, phi is the external angle for this triangle, so the beta plus gamma prime is equal to phi. So I can write it as a beta equal phi minus gamma prime. And then I look at these triangles and I introduce a height, which I denoted by h, which is a distance from optical axis to the point on the interface on which the beam hits the the glass, so to say. Okay, so we look at this triangle, and it is easy to calculate, observe that the tangent of the angle gamma is this h, and now I have two distances. The distance d is a distance between the ob object and the interface. And there is another number which is crucial, other length, which is crucial for our analysis. This is the, what is denoted by a little t, and this is the thickness of the, of, the, of, the, of the interface, so to say, right? Is the deviation from being flat. This is a one-sided interface, so the thickness is t. Soon we will be discussing a lens which will be completed by another interface on the right, and that will, be, that, in, that will be convenient then to denote the thickness of the, of the lens by twice t. And that is the reason why in some formulas 
all of a sudden a factor 2 will appear. So anyway, the triangle uh, with where there is angle gamma allow me to write that the tangent of gamma is a height divided by the sum of a d and t. And similarly, I can calculate the tangent of a gamma prime, which is the same age, but now it is divided by the distance i, which is the distance from the interface to the image, minus a thickness. So if I have these two trigonometric relations, then in addition, I can calculate the sine of the angle phi, which is a simply height divided by the radius of the curvature. So that is just a simple observation from the triangles on, this, on our screen. And then I... And now comes the approximation. Approximation that this is a tiny curved interface. If it's a tiny curved, then angle alpha and angle beta are very small. And if the angles alpha and beta are small, then the trigonometric function sine of these angles is approximately equal to the angle, provided we measure that angle in radians. We cannot do this in angles, in the degrees. We have to use the, 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 the radians. So if we do this, then I can calculate the sine of alpha, and since alpha is then the sine of alpha is simply equal to alpha, approximately, but this is, this is my assumed approximation. As Lambda used to say, a physics is a science of approximation. So we approximate the sine of alpha by this. And then because alpha is equal gamma plus phi, then using this, the, um, and a tangent is also, a tangent is a sine over cosine. So for small angles, the cosine is just one, and the sine is angle, so tangent is also equal to, to, to the angle. So I get the expression that the sine of alpha, or the angle alpha, is the height divided by the distance of d, plus a height divided by the radius. And a uh, very similar relation I can derive for the angle beta, which is height divided by the radius of the interface minus height divided by the distance of the object from the, from the interface. So that is a trigonometry. There was no physics so far. Okay? That is just analysis of this kind of a funny drawing which I have made. But now the physics comes. And of course, the, most imp the, imp the only physical part of this is the Snellius law. The Snellius law, which relates the angle alpha and beta, saying that the sine of them is a ratio of the, of the refraction indices. So I can then use this expression to substitute our geometric relations. And we got an equation which is on the board. And, of course, now the height cancels, as expected. This was arbitrary point on the interface, so the height cancel, and what remains is the geometric identity relating lengths only, a distance of an object from the interface, d, the distance of the uh, image from the interface i and the radius of the curvature for the interface and two physical quantities, the indices of the refraction. And that equation, which is derived here, as you, as you see, this very simple. And I should stress that there is just similar expression for arbitrary curved interface but it will take much longer uh, operations with the trigonometric functions. And uh, we, we, it, the physical essence, the silent features of the, what is happening is already here. This is a Gauss equation for a single refraction interface. And that is a crucial equation for our further analysis. All right, so now we uh, it's somehow Good back. 
Oops. All right. And now this is the same picture. And we have our Gauss equation, which is written on it. And now let's see what is happening when I take my object and I move it to the left. Uh, so I position my objects farther and farther and farther and farther and farther from the, from the, interf from the refraction interface. So eventually, when they are very, very, very far, then they look like they come parallel to the optical axis. I'm also making an assumption that because my op the interface is very thin, then I'm considering only those rays which are close to the, to the optical axis, and they are called parallax. Para, the, the approx this is a paraaxial approximation. We use on the very narrow region of beams close to the optical action. So if I move D to infinity, then the first term in the, on the left-hand side of the Gauss relation drops out. And uh, what is happening is now that something curious is happening on the right-hand side. If I move the object to infinity, the, this equation tells me that all the beams which are coming, they cross the optical line on the other side of the interface in a one particular point. And then one particular point is at the distance from the interface, which is called the focal distance, and is conven conventionally denoted by a letter F. Focus, for focus. So we get the, out of the Gauss analysis equation, we got the ex definition, what is focus? Okay. And then I can solve my Gauss equation, and I can relate the focus on the right-hand side, which will, uh, we, as the refraction index times the radius of a curvature divided by the jump, as they used to say, a difference of the refraction indices on both sides. This is denoted usually as a square bracket of n. This is the n, the difference between them. It's just a notation. This is a notation from the other part of physics, but it's used here. So this right focal length on the right-hand side of the interface is F2. And of course, similarly, I can define it on the, on the left-hand side of the mirror. So I can, using this focal distance, I can now rewrite the Gauss equation in the form which is written in this purple box. All right? Good. And I also can derive the identity. This is the identity, which is at the bottom of the screen, which says that the ratio of the focal length to the index of refraction is constant. And that is the identity which holds for all the lenses. I have derived it for a very simple kind of model, model, but they are very general. All right. So that is the analysis of a one interface. And there are a few sign rules which are, because there are this object is on the one side and the image is on the other, there has to be convention what is cost, what is calculated. I mean, we can put the object on the concave side of the, of, the, of the interface, then the sign have to be different from this length. So there is a certain accepted convention that if the, the real object distance is always positive. If the distance is outside, then it's always positive. And image distance for real images is positive, and for virtual images, those which are created when the when the object is in the denser medium, then it's negative. And the focal length is positive for converging lenses and negative for divergent lenses. 
So these are conventions, and uh, unfortunately, each time you study some lenses, you have to be very careful whether the authors follow the, uh, those uh, conventions. That, but uh, we are not in the business of making optical devices, so we can just have to remember that. So now I'm going to talk about the spherical lens. And the spherical lens is just two of our interfaces. And again, I will be talking about the, about the very, uh, about the thin lens, which means that uh, uh, the, 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 the older rays are paraxial and the, uh, the, therefore, the sign of the angle theta, which I heard denoted as a theta for, in order not, in order to slightly confuse you, uh, then uh, the, th the sign of that is uh, small. So now we have more complicated uh, geometrical situation. Uh, we can calculate these angles and uh, repeating basically the same arguments with the tangent functions, we can find the, one of the identities here. And since the tangent of the, of, the, of, the, of the angle is the angle, then we get the relation between the theta i, which is this angle on the uh, on the on the left uh, of, uh, uh, is uh, 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 on the on the image side is r by divided by r plus r plus d zero, where d zero is the distance to the to the object, and uh, I can uh, uh, for outgoing angles I can apply the same analysis and get another relation, so just adding these angles. This is exactly the same calculation, but done for two curved interfaces. I got the following relation. And again, now I use my Snell law. And if I lose the Snell law, I make a, a simple assumption that this is a lens in the air. If the lens is in the air, then one of these refraction indices, n one of the outside medium, so to say, is, uh, is just equal to 1. It saves me this square bracket. And then, I, if I make this assumption, substitute it in our idea, we derive the equation for the lens, which says that the index of recraftion over 2R, and this uh, uh, is, of course, 1 over focal length. So this means we finally arrive on the equation which you might remember from the high school. That is that 1 over focus is this. This equation is awful. It's 1 over something, right? But if you multiply them and rewrite it, then you get something which is also easy to remember. For some reasons, people prefer that form. So here it is, that 1 of the focal length is equal to some, okay. And that is, of course, a complicated story. Now we have this equation. And imagine you have now a device which consists of many optical lenses. You have to do something, and for some reason, it's not sufficient to use one magnifying glass. You want to build a real telescope. So you want to, for some reason, have. So you will, everything is soluble by this kind of analysis, but it's going to be messy. And people were doing it for years and years and years, and I believe some optics people are, on one of the references which you will, I will show you in a moment, you will, uh, you will see the calculation which I will do here without any difficulties. They are doing it with the trigonometry. But, uh, well, I think one should be a little bit lazy and do the, as little calculations as is necessary to get the final results. So we will now learn about the metric description of the optical devices, and this is called the ray matrices. So uh, imagine I want to build up a device which so it has an optical axis, and there are many different optical 
elements which are put up together, which are shown here by uh, funny drawings. And there is a, the beam, the, the, the property is that the beam goes over the one medium, then it gets into our optical element, gets out, gets another, again move freely, then gets into another element, gets out, move freely. This free motion of the beam is called by the experts drift. And that will be important in a moment. So anyway, this is our system. And um, we use this focal length and something. But what is actually important in our analysis so far? The analysis was the distance and the angle on which beam was going, OK? So what are these two things? The distance is how far from the, what I need to draw the picture. I need to know where the object was located with respect to the optical axis. So I need the distance from the optical axis. And I need the angle at which the beam is propagating. And that, of course, is a derivative of the beam. So the state of the beam which goes in the optical element uh, device can be characterized by a distance from the optical axis and the angle at which the beam is propagating. And that angle is denoted by r prime. Whatever is the distance, z or x or whatever, the derivative of, of, the, of, the, of the distance, how the distance of a beam changes from one point to another, the angle is just a derivative. So the optical device, whatever is the optical element, what it does, it transforms these two numbers. So what I have, if I have a device, then I can characterize the state of a beam by a vector, which is a position and the derivative. OK? And I have the incoming position and derivative. Then there is a device, the optical element, and the beam is coming out. And again, it has its position and the angle. So what is happening in the, in the optical elements, whatever is construction of that element, is nothing else and doing something with these two numbers. So if I have a two numbers and I generate two numbers, vector to the vector, then the mad this element can be, there's nothing else which can happen. It has, whatever is inside of that element can always be described by two by two matrix. Nothing else. So the only difficulty in doing something is to calculate the proper two by two matrix characterizing my given optical element. So if I have these elements, then construction of my device is very trivial. It's a multiplication of those elements because the next one will just do the same as the previous one. Perhaps the matrix will be different. But then the another one will have a different matrix. So when I forget about these matrices, then there's only multiplication of the matrices to be done. And that's very simple. So let's do this. Let's first look at the, and again, I apologize tremendously because my movie doesn't work. And the picture, therefore, is, <laughs> is you, you just see the first slide from the picture. There is a beam, but of course the beam changes, right? It goes at the angles. So it's not parallel, it's angle, OK? And uh, if I just have a, a homogeneous medium, a part of a homogeneous medium, and the beam comes and hits that homogeneous medium and gets out. So how do, what happens? The position. Uh, is uh, 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 outgoing position is related to the incoming position by a derivative at which the beam hits the medium and the thickness of the medium. 
because medium is homogeneous, so derivative is always the same. That we, we use by drawing the, the, B, the, the, the refractive indices in the lens, right? It always was straight because it was moving in a lens in a homogeneous medium. So that is the relation between outgoing and uh, incoming position, so to say, in the homogeneous medium. So I can easily write the matrix describing a propagation of a, a beam, optical beam, through a homogeneous medium of a width W. And this is a matrix which has a two, three elements different from zero. One is, and well, let's see whether this is going, if we multiply, we will get out this equation and uh, we will also get a proper relation between the derivatives. So this is a matrix for, the, for a, a, a drift in a medium of a given width. Now let's see what happens when I have a spherical lens. If I have a spherical lens with the focal length f, then I have this equation which I derived before, that is 1 over d0 plus 1 over di. Then I approximate this by the radius of the of the of the of the of the of the curvature of the lens and the angles again it's a paraxial approximation so i can replace the sine by just the angle and then the angle is a derivative so i have the relation between the focal length and the derivatives i can do a little bit of algebra and that's what I obtain, that the derivative of outgoing, outgoing derivative is the incoming derivative minus one over focal length divided by the incoming position. So that allows me to write a, 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 a matrix for the lens, which is the, the matrix for a thin lens here. And if I just have a refraction, if I have just an interface with two media, then the matrix is given by the four. The, the, then its corresponding matrix is also written here. So these are the examples of the matrices corresponding to the optical elements. So if I want to build now anything out of the optical, then it is just the multiplication of the matrices. And now comes a little bit of a difficulty. I would like to show you that it is extremely easy using this kind of thinking about the, de the, the devices to build up an enormously effective device. Device which is a sitting inside of any complicated optical instrument which does a Fourier transform. And that will be a a, a, a little bit of, on it. And how does, what is the problem? We have a lens, and the lens is a, is a, is a thin spherical lens, okay? And of course it has two focal, focal plane, focal points, and therefore it has two focal planes, okay? I can always draw the planes which are perpendicular to the, fo to the optical axis, okay? And uh, so there is a, a focal plane on the left and the focal plane on the right. What I will analyze is the situation where on the left plane, which is on the on left focal plane, I have a certain pattern of electric field. This is my picture, so to say. My, okay? And uh, let's analyze what happens with the different beams which are here shown. Okay? I have three regions for each of the beams. This is a region one, region two, which is inside of the lens, and region 3, which is outside. Region 1 and region 3, they are drifts. The beam is just propagating through a homogeneous medium 
with a certain refraction index, okay? So the beam goes from the point R, R1, and it goes at the angle, which is the derivative, R prime, and in the region one, its matrix is just the matrix 1F01, then it hits the lens, okay? So I have to apply the matrix describing the lens. Then it gets out of the lens, gets in the medium, which where it is described by the matrix, by a drift matrix. So the whole device, this what is happening between the two focal planes, is described by a product of these three matrices. So instead of solving all this complicated trigonometry, I can just multiply these two by two matrices, which is very trivial. And I underline that if I have a very complicated, and these matrices might be complex, then this multiplication can be done by a computer. It's a symbolic calculation, so it's very trivial. Mathematica or any program like this um, will do this in a fraction of a, of, of a blick of our eye. So we will get these results immediately. So for this particular set, my, 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 my matrix is, I, can, I multiplied it by hand, and this is the result. So if I have that result, then I can calculate what is happening on the focal plane on my right hand side. I know that R out is equal to the F times R prime. And um, so what do you see? You see that all the beams, all the points on the left hand side, they come to one point on the right. But they come with a different angle. So let's, uh, that is enough, that's, that's where the geometrical optics has been done, okay? This is just the mathematical conclusion. But now comes the physics. We were discussing these electromagnetic waves in a caricature way. We were only talking about this k-vector lines. But in fact, these are waves. So what is associated with which of those beams is the face of electromagnetic wave. And the phase depends on the path. So although they come to this one point, they come on a different lengths. So they have different faces. And if they have different faces, if you add waves with different faces, that is what, that's what is called interference. So all those beams now will be interfering in a very funny way, which is described by this relation. So let, what I will now do, I will now use this expression to calculate the phase difference. Okay, let's do this. Okay, this is our result. I can calculate the distances. The distance between the lens and the fur in the, on, on the left, for the, so to say, from the lens is given in an Again, because I'm only talking about the paraxial that is given by this very simple formula. And the distance on the right side of the length is also given like this. So the only thing which is left to remember is that the, uh, that the thickness of the leads on the optical axis is twice t, which I do not that t zero. And the thickness at a certain distance from the, from the axis, which is of the importance, that is T, T, and the curvature is R. So now this is a very simple relation, again for paraxial beams, that the thickness at the distance from the uh, uh, R from the optical axis is related to the thickness in the middle, so to say, of the lens, and the radius of the curvature, and this is the geometrical formula. So having this, I can now do the calculations. Again, of course, I know that the lens wave, the, 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 the length wave, wavelength of a light in a lens 
to the wavelength outside of the length, which is the same as the relation of the k vectors just inverted, is given by the index of a fraction. And again, I assume that this lens sits in the air, which might not be the best for building a device, but let's, let's stick to, to this. And then I can calculate the phase shift through the lens and if there was no lens. So I can calculate that, and this is the relation. So I can calculate this, uh, this, this phase shift, and since the radius is given related to the focal length, then I can do this uh, calculations. And now I add the phase shift. If I add the phase shift, that is the relation which I have obtained. Okay, now if I have this then this phase shift consists of two pieces. The one which is independently of distances, is independent of the R in and R out. It consists of the, what it depends on the wavelength of the radiation used, this is vector K, depends on the focal length of the lens, on the focal end, depends on, the, on, the, on its thickness. So this first part is, uh, I would say, a general. It doesn't change when I move my, when I do something with my beam. Okay? So now I have this phase difference and I have a certain distribution of electric field on the focal plane which was on the left. So how do I calculate the distribution of electric field on the right? I take this electric field, each beam which emerged from each point, I multiply by the phase factor, and I had to integrate over that plane. I do it in one dimension, I assume it's a one dimension. The, I mean, I can, can make it complicated for two dimensions, but the simple ways in, spheric, in cylindrical coordinates, but that is, again, I'm not teaching you how to build up a real devices on the, how it, what, is the, what is the silent feature of it, and that is a formula which I obtain. That is, means that the out, what I see on the other side of my mirror, of my, of my lens, is a, a, a the phase factor, which is universal, and then there is a funny integral. And that integral, this is a lens phase factor, and this integral is a Fourier transform of an electric field. The Fourier transform is a mathematical operation uh, which uh, is very convenient it, it is a linear operation. I believe I don't have this slide on it. But uh, the, uh, uh, this, this, if you want to see the real calculation for real situations, then you look up at this, at this references. And this is a picture which shows you what is, what is the use of it. The, the Fourier transform allows me to pick up a pieces of a signal. If I think of a picture as being a signal, which depends on the position, right? Then the Fourier transform gets an elementary piece of it and puts together, and since I have these elementary pieces, I can manipulate them. Okay? If I have that lens, and uh, by using different lens, different focal lenses, I can, and moving these focal planes, then I can pick up a different Fourier trans components of my, of my picture. And that allows me, for example, to remove a certain wavelength from the spectrum of the picture. And that is what is done here. This is the, uh, 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 a, a picture taken by an object, and then it's a Fourier transform, optical Fourier transform, which removes a very short wavelength from the picture. So we get this little point, okay? 
Now, you sent somewhere, you want to send that picture somewhere. You don't need to send this whole picture. You need to send only this little point and the information which wavelength you have removed. And you, on the other, on a receiver side, so to say, you have a device which does the inverse. Okay? So saves you enormously in moving the film. And the Fourier transform is extremely important if you want to send a complicated pictures and uh, sending a pictures is very... If you send a picture from your phone, you, you, you make a picture and then you want to send it via the cell system to somebody else, then usually it asks you what size of the picture you want to send. Okay? That size is how many components of a proper analysis is used. Okay? The receiver gets the much less information, but also gets information what has been removed. Okay? So it does the reconstruction and you got the picture. Because these procedures are not usually very good, then you lost it. Okay, so that is how the Fourier transform is being used, and that is very trivially analyzed by using a multiplication of the matrices, as I have shown on a very simple model, but of course it can be done in a more complicated ways, and references have been given. But anyway, that still used the lens. And in a, this is a picture, in, uh, in 2013, as a, almost the one breath of the Bell Labs, the Bell Labs announced that, it made, that they have made the camera which doesn't have lenses. And this is a very recent paper from last year by a bunch of people calling it lens less imaging with compressive ultra-fast sensing. And uh, I have not yet decided whether I will be talking about all details, but we will be talking about these lenses because that's important for understanding. Because the mathematics is exactly the same as analysis computer acts, computer tomography, which I would like to talk about. So this is the picture which shows basic physical idea for these lensless pictures. We have a picture which is on the left, okay? And it is illuminated with light. So each point of a picture sent, reflects the light. So in this parlor of, the, of construction, this, it is said that each point of my picture emits the electromagnetic radiation. Okay? And I have a sensor to my right. And there are no lenses. What is in this? There are, suppose there are three, three of those sensors as on the picture. Okay? Now, if the point on the object sends electromagnetic light, then there is a cone of information which is sent. The, pic the picture is, has to be understood using a special theory of relativity. Now, the beam comes out from that point, and it takes different time before it hits the different... different uh, Point, points on the receiver, right? It takes a different time. So if I record that different time, then I learn something about this point. And if I record that different time for different points on my picture, then I get sufficient amount of information to reconstruct the picture. So this is a basic basic idea of the lensless photography. I have to have enormously fast quotation chip, which is, an, uh, is so fast that it can resolve the arrival of the signals from, from the same emitter at different positions. Okay? And I get a mess of the information, and I don't need any hardware. The accuracy is limited by the region of, the, of my sensors. So it's the aperture 
which this decides. But making an aperture is much easier than making a lenses. So you get the device which collects the information, and then it's a mathematics, it's a computer, which constructs the picture. The fantastic side of this is that if you collect it from three-dimension objects, if you use the third dimension, then you get even more messy picture. But what is hidden in, that in this mass of the information collected that way is not only the picture by itself, but also the focal depth. So you don't need to set a focal depth. You don't need to move the lenses like in a camera. You need to move the focus, right? Yeah, it's already there. So you can pick up from one, so to say, picture, from one set of data. You can pick up a pictures with different, what is in front, what is in the back, and something. That is a very messy calculation. It requires a huge computer power. And the most important part of this calculation is if you want to recover the depth. So what the people do, <laughs> they do this via the lenses. They use the, le they use the lens, so to say, on the other side of the camera. The camera doesn't look at you via the lenses. There is no lens between you. But there is a lens, so to say, in the back, which tries to de pick up from the mass of this uh, pixels, points on this, on, the, on this data sheet to pick up the picture. So we will be talking next time about the introductory to the lensless photography, which is actually already there in the analysis of the lens. It is remarkable that you can derive the basic mathematics for the lensless photography, and that of course means also for the computer tomography, by just looking again on the equations which we already wrote and just realizing one <laughs> silent feature of those pictures which we all see but we didn't recognize them before. Thank you for today. <laughs>